Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would please, to three places, Colossians 3, James 5, Luke 19. Colossians 3, James 5, Luke 19, and Colossians 3, we'll talk about the first two of our, I think, four Ps today. We'll be talking about purpose and posture. And then we'll apply those into a couple unique ways that may not first occur to us when it comes to what we think of as service, um, but it helps us think about all of our lives in a way that can be service. So, skipping, 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 skipping. The posture and the purpose of service is to glorify God in all things with all your heart. The first of three things we'll be saying today, and this is Colossians 3, the purpose and posture of service is to glorify God in all things with all your heart. Look at verse 17, if you would please, just the first four words in Colossians chapter 3, and whatever you do, which does mean, of course, whatever, whether this, that, big or small, working, playing, teaching, listening, eating, drinking, 1 Corinthians 10, Everything in everyday life that might be thought of by us as mundane, yes, it means that for sure. But Paul here is particularly focusing on the everyday life whatevers to make a significant point about those whatevers having a purpose that takes them beyond everyday whatevers. He's making a significant point about the purpose of service here. And so he says, verse 17, whatever you might, that's what we call the subjunctive mood, nerds. So the potential, what you might do, whatever you might do in word or deed. In word or deed, which isn't here just about speaking and doing, generically, though it is, like the whatever, he's using it for the purpose of explaining the higher call for service. So in the context of the preceding verses here, word and deed isn't just about your generic speaking and doing from verses 15 and 16. You can look that up later. It's not just about your words and deeds flowing from a generic place of <laughs> having a sense of purpose that comes from being a Christian and maybe knowing that you're supposed to do things and having a sense of duty about it or because your mom or dad or grandma and grandpa did or he was a preacher and, you know, that, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that gets us somewhere. But it doesn't get us where Paul wants to take us. In the context of the preceding verses where he's talking about word and deed in the various kinds of ways. He's talking about service flowing from a heart of peace where Christ's word rules, where God's law through the Spirit, where Christ's word rules so that our words and deeds point to him, point to him as Lord. And so in, insofar as our behavior, our words, our deeds, whatever it is, whatever you may do, if they point to Christ, they have become an act of worship. This is where he's headed here with this whole thing. Our service can be worship when done in ways that accord with what Jesus has done for us. That's why he says this, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. So whatever you do, word or deed, everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus as an act of service that is directed toward him as Lord because he has authority over all. Service that is directed to him and under his authority is a way to say, I am under your authority and everything I do comes from you because you're creator. And because I have new life in Christ, because the spirit has made my heart new, I can hear the word and I can respond in ways that mean everything I do can be a form of worship. And so this is, this is the purpose. <laughs> and we've said it as glorifying God. We'll get there in a bit here, but what he's done here, he said, whatever you do, word or deed, 
Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. It connects our whatever we do and our word and deed and our do everything to the purpose of serving Christ as Lord, as an act of worship, which is why he ends verse 17 by further clarifying that your whatever and your everything and your seemingly unimportant mundane service that nobody else sees, even that is you giving thanks. It's giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul is saying that we are, we are never, if we have Christ, we are never truly merely serving another person. And we should never measure the worth of service on that basis. Friends, we could save ourselves a whole lot of grief and frustration and false sense of identity if we learned that all of our service is ultimately not about the horizontal relationship, but that we are giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're never truly serving another person, but we are serving Christ. We're serving Christ because he's Lord. In speaking of his own coming at the final judgment, Jesus says in Matthew 25, the king will answer them. Speaking of himself as king, the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, not speaking of himself, but to those in relationship to us in human horizontal terms, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You served me. Your whatever you do's and your words and deeds, <laughs> even the acts of love and service and kindness and grace that people don't count, that your spouse may not see, that your kids have no idea about, that you're holding out hope that they might continue to as they grow older. All of those kinds of things, counted by no one else this side of heaven, are seen by the Savior who counts it as worship from you. That's a totally radically different way of thinking about our lives and our resources and what God's given us. So friends, the, the purpose of our service and the giving of ourselves is to return thanks to God as an act of worship. It's ultimately about serving Christ because it's an expression of his work as Lord of all creation who freed us from sin in the grave. So now jump down to verse 33, I'm sorry, 23, where we're going to focus on the, the posture of our service. We've just talked about the purpose. This is about posture, by which we mean the attitude and the manner of our serving, the way we approach it. And even though we've already seen some of this in terms of having an attitude that sees even the small whatevers and words and deeds and everything's a service in verse 17, there's more to see here. Look at verse 23. He says, whatever you do, again, this is a might do, whatever you may potentially, possibly, whatever it is that you may do in the future. So, so again, Paul says, because three times in verse 17, apparently weren't enough, whatever you might do, this is the posture, work heartily. Work and labor, this is a command, work and labor with all your heart, with all your heart, or as the word uh, psyche here means, with all of your soul, in, in every area of your life, emphasizing especially the all part of one's life, more than the amount of effort, though that is in there too. This is like when Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6.5. He did this a few times in the Gospels. Deuteronomy 6.5 is the Shema, the Old Testament people of God, said this every day to remind themselves that their lives from day to day was meant to be an act of worship and service to God. And so Jesus quotes this, says, this is the most important commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. Same idea that Paul's talking about here. Work with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Serve God in all things, in every, in every single unseen nook and cranny of your life. 
and not just the public stuff. Because he sees it, he counts it. So this really cool two-word phrase, work heartily, sets the standard for the posture and attitude of service that functions as worship and as thanks. And it does so here with the word work as a, as a command in the imperative, work. And then it says, to do so in all of life, with all of yourself, work heartily, notice, as for the Lord, and not for men. I've loved this phrase for myself over the years, time and time again when I thought, I should be getting credit for this. thinking, why don't people turn off the lights for crying out loud? Wash their own dishes. I mean, come on. Okay, although I'm telling you now, so apparently I'm getting a little bit of credit, which I pick silly things that don't matter much. But when we do this, not so that we're getting credit horizontally, because as Jesus says, your reward, you've had it, that's it. It's as for the Lord, as unto the Lord, as worship, as service, as thanks, acknowledging his authority and his lordship over all creation, including you. As for the Lord, not for men, not so that men notice, not so that you are merely serving to get the temporary warm fuzzies of man's applause, but as if done for his approval. Because you see, Unlike you and me, who ultimately don't deserve it, he does. Work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing, it's a certainty word, knowing from a place of hope, knowing that from the Lord, notice, you will receive. You will receive the reward of heaven that he's won for you. So this really cool two-word phrase sets the standard for our posture and attitude and says, ultimately, as worship, you're receiving the inheritance that he's won for you because he's the firstborn son and God the Father gives him that reward that he's won for us, which is to say, friends, his humble service was our only hope of any reward. So it's all for God's glory that you serve. It's with all of life that you serve. With the purpose of of glorifying God. With a posture in all things and with all your heart. Because, verse 24, you are serving the Lord Christ. What an important, helpful thing to remember. Now, as we said at the beginning, after looking at the posture and the purpose, we look at a couple ways that may not occur to us first. And since I have about a minute left, technically, I do have my numbers right here. We're going to fly through this. Number two is prayer as serving. And there's a unique way that this is serving that may not be clear at first, but it's right here in the text. Prayer as serving. Why? Because it's God's work in others' lives that you're acknowledging and when to come alongside with and say, how cool is this that God forgives us? Jump into James 5. Therefore, a bunch of stuff skipped. Therefore, two imperatives, two commands. Confess, pray. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Now, can you confess to yourself? I mean, eh, not, not really, no. It's, it's spoken of as a, as a corporate together, not just you, thing here. In fact, throughout the whole passage, this assumption is clear. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. This is intercessory prayer, as we call it, on behalf of somebody else. And this happens in community with one another, stressing the importance here of a vulnerability that, for many of us, feels like a threat, but is the assumption that has to happen in order for 
together prayer to be a context where realizing the forgiveness we have in Christ can happen. It says, confess and pray so that you may be healed because the prayer of a righteous person, the prayer of someone who in the larger context of what he's talking about in James, who has received forgiveness, who understands righteousness in Christ, someone who knows the freedom from the power of their sins because they have confessed and prayed for one another, with one another. And not because they are themselves somehow righteous and therefore have power in and of themselves. (laughs) This is the kind of prayer that comes from someone who understands the gospel. That's the kind of prayer that has great power as it's working. Which is to say, friends, if you're not in regular relationship with somebody and praying with somebody, you're missing out on an experience of forgiveness and freedom to realize the righteousness of Christ that makes the gospel true. He says it. You're you're missing out. Thirdly, personal relationship and gospel proclamation as serving. Oh, there's so much good stuff here with Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. It creates a context for encounter with Christ. In Luke 19, let's just read it and jam through real quick and then talk about the uh, takeaway thoughts. This is about Jesus, Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho. He was passing through. This is Jesus doing what he does as he's going about his day, making disciples, going. But he wasn't just passing through without purpose. It says, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. Not just not liked because he was in charge of taxes, but not liked because he was in charge of the guys who were in charge of taxes. Which means he made more than they did by taxing more than they did. And he was the one who was in league with the bad guys. So his own people, to, to say they despised him is to, is to soften it. And so that's the one to whom Jesus says, verse 5, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Of all things, I'm inviting myself to your house. My house? Why would you come to my house? Nobody wants to come to my house. Only the fancy, hoity-toity, political, governmental people who aren't God's people like to come to my house. So, verse 6, he hurried, he came down, he received him joyfully. With the kind of joy that understands what it means to be in an encounter with Jesus. We know this because, well, on the one hand, verse 7 Those who didn't like Zacchaeus nor Jesus, they all grumbled. He's gone into the guest of a man who was a sinner. That's how I think about it. But Zacchaeus, in contrast to the grumblers, Zacchaeus, who received him joyfully, says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus says, Today, salvation has come to this house because he's there, but also because it's clear that Zacchaeus has received him as Savior and Lord. And then he says, in the hearing of the grumblers, why has salvation come? Because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The personal relationship of Jesus seeking to be with Zacchaeus was the context within which the gospel proclamation bore its fruit. The number one kind of service we don't count that perhaps matters more than anything else is to seek and save the lost in relationship with people So creation 
of a context of the proclamation of the truth of the gospel can be how someone in a relationship with you experiences Christ. Friends, that's service. So three quick things that are takeaway thoughts that we will read. Read only, no comment, number one. It's basically an application of the three things we've said. Service is worship when done for God's glory in all of life as an extension of Christ's service for us and an expression of hope of being satisfied with him forever. Number two, prayer is service when it helps us participate in God's work in the lives of others. And then number three, personal relationship and gospel proclamation when they come together. They are service because they create a context for someone to encounter Christ. Friends, how is God calling you? Here's our takeaway question, and then we'll pray. How is God calling you to serve someone else this week so that you might more deeply know and love the God who served you in Christ? Let's pray, friends. Father in heaven, indeed, we only know you and the hope of heaven and the inheritance that you won for us in heaven because someone served us. Someone who loves you, sacrificed for us so that we would have relationship that you won for us, that you made possible and they were a vessel for that. Lord, make of us people who think that way, who love to serve because we've been served by you for the sake of your glory, for the sake of worship and thanks because you're worthy. Help us to be a people, Lord, who are in relationship with one another and who pray for that kind of opportunity to serve. For the sake of your goodness and glory, we pray. 